Forbes is reporting that Binance is moving its reserves uh, or was moving its reserves that was meant to collateralize its stellar peg stablecoin BSD through Tron, Amber Group, Alameda Research, and other crypto firms for undisclosed uses. And Binance CEO Changpeng Zhao shooting back yesterday that Tron and its users are simply withdrawing funds on their own. But we want to get to the bottom of this. So we have on the show, Justin Sun, founder of Tron, who will be global advisor and ambassador of Grenada to the WTO with us. Justin, thank you so much for joining us. We'd love for you to clear the air here. Forbes is reporting one thing, Binance is saying another. What do you say? Is Tron receiving and deploying BUSD reserves for investment purposes or just withdrawing its own funds? So I think it's uh, only withdraw our own funds. So we know like recently um, BUSD has stopped minting. So that's why I think most of the funds is just like withdraw from the ecosystem. Uh, myself also uh, withdraw some of the funds, uh, but I will continue to uh, invest like other uh, blockchain projects. So, Justin, I I, I want to ask about this whole. Uh, they, back in September, Binance announced that they were going to automatically convert uh, U, things like USDC into BUSD, or at least a a, a, a pegged version of BUSD. Uh, and, and my understanding is that if if there was a, a stablecoin, let's say on the Tron uh, on the Tron network, that they that they would issue BUSD on Tron. Correct? It was this done automatically. How, how did it work on the back end? Was it done manually or, or, or did it automatically happen? Did somebody have to uh, do it every day, for instance? Or what, exactly what, what went on and how did you guys experience that? Yes, I think from um, basically, I think Binance just released like BUSD on Tron like a week before they um, basically. Uh, um, BUSD stop like minting BUSD anymore. So before that, I think is Binance will deposit a fund on Ethereum, a BUSD on Ethereum in a fixed addresses and uh, mirror uh, on these Ethereum addresses. There will be um, 100 million, you know, one to one uh, um, Binance pack Tron BUSD, right? And uh, mm-hmm. also we have BUSD on Ethereum. So, um, so, so basically, I think that's like the step and the how uh, how we mint it. What, 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 was it done? Auto, was it automated, or was there was there any human intervention in that process? Uh, I think the the minting itself is more like a manual mint. So, so basically, we will mint one hundred. Uh, basically, I think more like pixels at that time. Uh, um, basically, uh, Binance will put $100 million uh, BUSD on Ethereum into uh, addresses as uh, collateral as addresses for those $100 million Binance pack BUSD on Tron. Justin, I'm just curious, what do you make of that Forbes article? Do you think it's just fear, uncertainty, and doubt? Or do you think there is something going on at Binance that raises real concerns? Uh, I think for Forbes article, probably the report misunderstood like the funds withdraw from different institutions with the addresses um, um, Binance published before. Um, so basically, I think for Binance addresses, uh, we have two type of the addresses. One address is, is Binance customer funds, right? Which is completely uh, for everybody to withdraw. And the uh, other addresses um, basically is for uh, Binance pack uh, US dollar addresses. Um, so the label on the label tag on those addresses might not be accurate. Uh, because um, Ether scan um, um, don't really have like accurate label, so that's why I think uh, journalists sometimes may uh, basically uh, misunderstand how Binance use those addresses. But as a customer, uh, when I uh, use those funds, so I basically withdraw and deposit my funds 
uh, those parts has nothing to do uh, with the pack uh, Binance US dollars, either BUSD or USDT, USDC uh, at all. Was Binance lending any of its uh, any of the collateral that it that it received from customers such as USDC? Was it lending it to uh, the, that list of customers? Any of those customers such as uh, Cumberland, et cetera? Uh, do do we know or do you know if they were actually lending that collateral uh, while they held it? Uh, I don't know that, uh, and we currently don't have lending and borrowing business with Binance. But do you know if they do that with any of their other customers, such as such as Cumberland? Uh, I don't know for 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 this one. Justin, what's up? Let's move to Hong Kong. Um, so a uh, lot happening in Hong Kong right now. Um, Huobi has applied for a license. Let's just talk about this license for a moment because there's been a lot of celebration of Hong Kong as a new crypto hub. But my understanding is that it is not going to be easy to get these licenses, right? It's actually going to be quite difficult. Um, I know you are very confident that Huobi will get a license, but can you tell us a little bit about what is required to get this license and how hard you think it's going to be? Yes. Um, first of all, I think for the license in Huobi, we have two different layers. So we have number one, number nine license, uh, which is the first step if you want to get VASP license in Hong Kong. And we have number seven. So so basically, I think for Huobi uh, license application, uh, we will first apply for number one and the number nine first. And then after we get number one and number nine, uh, we will move to number seven. So I think for the first step, number one and number nine, uh, I definitely have confidence we can get them. And then uh, after we get uh, the first step, uh, we will move on number seven, uh, which might be a little bit harder because right now only two institutions in Hong Kong get number seven license. Um, but I think eventually since Huobi is one of the leading blockchain exchange in the region. So I, I definitely confident uh, Huobi will secure the license. So I think another big question for people here is what this means for mainland China. And I'm wondering if you could break this down. Now, obviously, if this is happening in Hong Kong, one would assume that Beijing, you know, knows about it and is at least OK with it. Right. Um, but the question is, is what does this mean for crypto uh, on, in mainland China and crypto traders in mainland China. Can you just break us break down what these moves in Hong Kong might mean for the mainland Chinese crypto market? Yes, definitely. Uh, first of all, I think Beijing uh, sees Hong Kong as one of the experiment zone for cryptocurrency. Uh, in the past five years, um, we might learn from like Chinese government is not friendly uh, uh, about crypto at all. But actually, uh, I think these past two years, uh, actually the uh, the management uh, team in Hong Kong and also even um, the ex executives in Beijing probably changed their attitude. So that's why they want to see Hong Kong do it first and then to see the result. If it has positive feedback, they might change the policy in mainland China as well. Um, so that's why I, I think right now Hong Kong government is taking a very uh, transparent and flexible way uh, to discuss crypto regulation with market participants. Uh, Huobi is also one of the uh, advisors, uh, uh, and we also talked to uh, FSC uh, recently about uh, crypto stablecoin uh, policy, uh, and we learned a lot from government and how they want to uh, regulate stablecoin. Uh, definitely, I, I believe in the next uh, three months, um, basically before uh, June 1st, uh, we will have more uh, regulation and news comes out. And um, actually, I'm quite optimistic about the cryptocurrency development in either Hong Kong and China. And I believe um, Asia capital will be the driving force for the next bull run for crypto market. 
Yeah, Justin, I've been saying pretty much the same thing. So I agree with you on that. I just want to, so you talked a little bit about China uh, policy. I just want to talk a little bit about what this means for Chinese crypto traders right now, mainland Chinese crypto traders. So there's definitely some speculation about how these moves in Hong Kong will affect mainland traders. For example, they could open Hong Kong bank accounts, or maybe we'll see more developers moving to Hong Kong or closer to Hong Kong, or maybe we'll see more Chinese projects moving from Singapore to Hong Kong. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how it's going to affect sort of like people right now, not not on the policy level, just on the like immediate level. Yes, for sure. Uh, I think for most of the Chinese people, mainland Chinese people, it's definitely a very good news because in the last three years, uh, because we have this kind of the COVID lockdown restriction, so um, anyone uh, in mainland China cannot go to Hong Kong. But these days, since we have uh, uh, open up the border. Um, so I'm currently actually in Hong Kong. We've seen uh, uh, numerous people come to Hong Kong every day from China. So actually uh, today, Hong Kong has become like one of the most important Web3 hub um, for the whole Asia. Uh, and uh, most of the people in mainland China today come to Hong Kong for Web3 Summit, for Web3 development. Uh, and for Web3 uh, discussion. Actually, yesterday I, I, I be into like a cafeteria, also rebrand them as a Web3 cafe. So, so that's why I think the enthusiasm and uh, everything in Hong Kong uh, is very bullish. And uh, one of the most important driving force is from mainland China. I, I see uh, different people and all my friends from mainland China come to Hong Kong every day. And I think this probably going to become like one of most important patterns uh, in the next uh, next year. Yeah, certainly a different uh, energy than what we're seeing in the United States with regulators cracking down on the crypto industry. Uh, I just want to also move to another topic. So earlier uh, this week, staking platform Lido Protocol registered its largest daily stake inflow with over 150,000 staked ETH and a blockchain analytics company, Arkham Intelligence, was claiming that the transactions were mostly from you. First of all, is that true? Uh, so I did stake some of the ETH I have into Lido platform. Uh, one of the reason is because I'm confident for the Shanghai upgrade, um, um, which is going to be coming soon. Uh, I believe uh, Shanghai upgrade gonna be finished in Q2. Um, so which is a very important milestone for uh, Ethereum, which uh, Chuang will also uh, launch liquidity staking uh, at the end of Q1 as well. Uh, so basically the same time with Ethereum. So that's why I have been paying a lot of attention about liquid staking on uh, Ethereum uh, these days. Uh, we uh, basically Chuang and Ethereum, I think at the same time we will launch liquid staking uh, together. Okay. Um, are you concerned at all with uh, U.S. regulators cracking down on staking services after the Kraken, Kraken settlement? Yes, I believe this is also um, a good news for decentralized staking, right, such as uh, a Lido platform, um, because right now the main platform for staking is Coinbase staking, uh, uh, and Kraken before, right? So, but Kraken already settled with SEC to wind down the staking services, uh, which I believe in the future, uh, probably for liquid staking, decentralized liquid staking gonna be the uh, um, the only way. So that's why for myself, I also choose uh, decentralized liquid liquid staking services. All right, Justin. Well. Thank you so much for your insights. A lot to talk about today. That was Tron founder, who will be global advisor and ambassador of Grenada to the WTO, Justin Sun.